He's a vegan, so I know that vegans, you guys like to talk to each other. So if you would like to uh, talk about veganism, you can connect with this gentleman. His favorite drinks are espresso and beer. And the other one is just coffee, 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 and water. Uh, that's what, so if you want to find a way to connect with these two gentlemen afterwards, if it's not veganism, then over coffee is probably a good way to make it happen. So if they're mic'd up and ready, please put your hands together for Urshith and Alistair. Thank you. Thanks, man. Uh, Enjoy. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for that, uh, that great introduction. You know how you, how you know someone's vegan, right? Don't worry, they'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think another thing we have in common is that Urshid and I are both very modest. It, it was a great introduction. Basically, I'm a journalist. I cover venture capital. Urshid is a venture capitalist. He, invest in uh, entrepreneurs. So, is our mics on? Are our mics on? All right, we'll, we'll figure it out. Thank you. Shout out again if you still can't hear. Uh, we'll do our best. Uh, before we begin, before we hear uh, what Rashid has to say, just curious uh, who's here in the audience. How many, how many are entrepreneurs? Or do you work at a tech company? Great, the majority of you as we expected. Okay. So if you're curious who this gentleman is who just walked up on stage, do not be afraid. He's Albert. He's a guy who makes all the sound work. So he'll be back and forth. Yeah, let's give him a hand. Absolutely. Yeah, it's hard work, you know? Thank you. <laughs> Great work. We couldn't do it without you. I can hear it now. Thank you. Great. Uh, how many of those entrepreneurs are in the healthcare, the bio, the digital health field? Really? That's it? Oh, OK. Uh, well, not very many of you. Uh, how, many, how many investors are in the room? Good, very good. Uh, Urshid, good morning. Good morning. Great to, great to have you here. You, uh, you lead the genomics uh, practice at Mayfield, but uh, your background is in, yeah, you're a longtime entrepreneur, uh, operator and investor, but your background is also in enterprise and SaaS. How did, just quickly, how did you veer into uh, the healthcare field? Uh, sure, so I think a lot of the people who are in the healthcare field are there. Uh, mainly, very often because uh, there's a personal experience that takes you down that path. Mm -hmm. So I had one of those health issues seven, eight years ago, and uh, went cold turkey in the healthcare system, body hacked myself uh, to, to good health, no drugs kind of dynamic. Um, but, but then um, it sort of got me thinking about why is the system the way it is, and, and got me looking at the system a lot more. And uh, you know, there is, uh, there is the rational reason on why I kind of went into it, and then there was the, the emotional reason. I think. Uh, uh, if I had to kind of summarize that part of it out, the emotional reason is really, you know, what do you want to do with the rest of your life, the time, the impact, and then how can you touch so many more lives? And, uh, and finding myself at Mayfield, which is a platform which did, uh, uh, where, you know, the second generation of Mayfield invested in companies like Amgen, Genentech, Intuitive Surgical, Applied Biosystems, right? Some of the most seminal companies that led to the birth of biotech. Uh, I did find myself asking, what is the sixth generation We're going to talk about what the fourth generation did? Uh, but besides that, what uh, also happened is uh, it's, it's a, a very interesting time because you have a culmination of sort of two big things that have happened simultaneously. I think the, the first was this uh, realization that anytime uh, a sector gets reinvented with technology, uh, you know, we get to sort of build great companies. So at Mayfield, you know, while we have a lot of companies that have been in, in sort of classic and, you know, deep tech enterprise and consumer, uh, when um, you start seeing an intersection of tech with energy, and we get to do solar city tech with uh, you know, transportation, and that's where a series A and Lyft kind of emerges. And so uh, what we saw was that there's this once in a generation dynamic where you can digitize biology very easily. You know, the cost to sequence a genome has gone from a billion for a person to like a thousand, it's trending to a hundred, and, and in another five years will probably be in, in $10 range or something like that. Uh, but not only that, there's a whole bunch of other techniques that is just quantifying the living state. You have all the health records that have come online. You have wearables. You have uh, CRISPR that can be used to even just detect nucleic acids without devices, a bunch of stuff in single cells. So you get all of this ability to digitize, make information. Once you get information, you can now apply all the IT uh, tools, AI cloud, all of that stuff. Uh, but in parallel, biology itself has made it, uh, has become an engineering field. So you have gene editing, mm. gene synthesis. Uh, you know, bioprinting, 
uh, cell engineering, all of these things allow you to actually engineer life and build new applications. And these new applications are new foods, right? So if you see Impossible Foods or Beyond, they're an example of that. New materials, new diagnostics, new therapeutics. And this whole loop is hitting critical mass because the cost to digitize biology is kind of getting to zero. So this whole sort of broad thing means that we think we are going to see the use of biology as technology, and it's going to create a really next, I, I believe that the next $100 billion company is going to be out of this category. It's going to be in the category of? Correct. And then, of health in, or, yeah. correct. And then in parallel, what also happened is that if you look at the country in the last 50 years, um, I, I wrote a blog about it over the holidays, talking about how the biggest threat to America is the biggest entrepreneurial opportunity of all time. And the summary is that in the last 50 years, most of the wage increases that people have had have actually gone into the cost of healthcare. And so if you take out the cost of healthcare, most people haven't had a pay raise for 50 years. And, and that has a, a whole bunch of political dynamics, and the existing healthcare system is not going to go fix itself. So that's the opportunity for a next generation of entrepreneurs to sort of reinvent big parts of the system. You, you've mentioned the healthcare system a, a few times. Is, is it broken? Is that, is, does that present a huge opportunity here for, for entrepreneurs in the, in the healthcare field? So uh, what's, your, what's your take? Yeah, no, big, big problems create big opportunities. So I think uh, it is a big problem and it is a big opportunity. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's easy to say it's broken, right? The bigger question is how do you sort of go ahead and fix it? Or, or where do you sort of build big businesses? And, uh, and, and, and so I think, uh, you know, healthcare is right now about 20% of the US GDP. Um, that's close to $4 trillion. Now, one would argue that if people live longer and the economy gets richer, people should be spending more on health and wellness. So why not a third of the economy? Uh, the problem is not how big the healthcare sort of sector is or how much it costs. Um, it's actually that our efficiency has gone down quite significantly. So efficiency. Yeah. If it, so about half of, uh, you know, uh, so, so the U.S. Uh, sort of outcomes, uh, you know, for the same spend are half that of the rest of the developed world. And, and therein sort of lies kind of the problem. So you have uh, every entity in the healthcare system really cares a lot about efficiency. And this would be hospitals want to actually get, hospitals actually get paid in a bundled payment model. So they want to actually cure you, send you home. Insurance companies would rather not use, see you go into the hospital, so would rather keep you healthy. Pharma companies don't really want to spend $2 billion to get a drug to market or billion and a half. They might as well do those things kind of faster. People want to kind of stay healthier uh, without having to exercise too much kind of thing. Uh, the government itself, which spends 40% of the healthcare dollars in the country, wants to cover more people, expand coverage. So the problem is, how do you sort of get each of these entities to sort of do a lot more with what they want to do? And that's the entrepreneurial opportunity, because their existing vendors are not going and telling them how they are going to go and get twice the benefit at half the price in sort of, in sort of the coming year. And, uh, and, and what enables this efficiency sort of view was this engineering biology point that I kind of mentioned, where that enables precision you know, wellness, precision care, precision medicine, uh, you, know, computa you know, computational drug development, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, what, makes, what makes the health, for the entrepreneurs out there, what makes the healthcare field different than, than other sectors? Is, are there, what have you learned from, from your experience in investing in it? Yeah, yeah it is, uh, I, I think that's, that's a great, uh, sort of great sort of thing to highlight and recognize. Uh, healthcare is different in many ways. It's one of the few markets where supply drives demand. So by that, what, what I mean is that, you know, what is the market for this therapy? Well, once, or, or this new device, right? Uh, before the device came to market, the opportunity wasn't there, but now that the device is there, it's gonna get prescribed more and more. You know, people will live longer. That'll kind of require them to kind of get more and more care. So it's one of those interesting dynamics where supply truly sort of drives demand. So you can't just think of it as, you know, do, give this treatment and then sort of kind of work the cure. I guess that's true for, for, uh, for drugs as well as, as med tech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supply yeah. so, drives demand. Correct. Then the other thing is uh, it's the market forces don't naturally work very easily. Uh, this is because, uh, uh, you know, this factoid comes as, you know, I, I submitted a, a post to a leading publication and the editor actually just discarded the post on the first line and that's a comment I'm going to make, which is it's not an opinion, it's a fact. But 75% of hospitals in the U.S. are nonprofits, um, and and it wouldn't feel like that. Stanford, Sutter, right? But but when you have a nonprofit, it's a very different decision dynamic. The government, uh, you know, it's it's a very consensus-driven model. They are operating on a mission to kind of improve care, but it's not like selling to a business. Uh, you know, the government itself is not only the biggest sort of contributor 
Uh, they pay 40% of the healthcare bills, right? This is between Medicare, Medicaid, VA, all of that stuff like that. But ironically, is actually one of the biggest agents of change in the system. Uh, they, like, you know, we had the, the Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, and it had a lot of great ideas. Uh, you know, we expanded coverage. A lot of the stuff on the cost side didn't make it into the system, but one of the things that did is the government actually was the first one not, not of the insurance companies, but the government was the first one to say we are actually going to pay for outcomes rather than continuing to sort of pay for procedures. Uh, the other thing that is different about this sector is that a lot of the buying decisions for technology are made by people who are not technologists. Uh, you know, if you really think about it, doctors, nurses, hospital administrators, even consumers, patients, they're not really technologists. And, and, and so when people are trying to sell new cool technology, uh, and, and a lot of them are not experts at doing this. They are not great analysts, but they are great sort of, they have, they have a lot of empathy, they are in it for the sense of mission. So there's a lot of these factors, uh, you know, the user and the payer are very different entities, right? In most markets, you generally end up having, um, you know, a, a much greater core, you know, connection between who's using your product versus who's paying for it. So, so these are all things that make the business uh, one of the hardest sort of uh, categories to build a new startup in. Uh, and so I do think that the failure rate is going to be among the highest uh, around this category. You think failure rate in the healthcare field is more than, than say, enterprise or consumer tech? Or? Yeah, actually, I think uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, is going, it, is, it is pretty high and it is going to be higher. And the reason is because, you know, founding teams need to do so many things simultaneously, right? Uh, any one of them would be good enough to build a decent-sized company elsewhere. So first, I think you have to solve a really hard sort of problem, which has sort of an innate barrier to entry because it takes a long time to kind of make impact in the space. So you need to have either an IP or data network effect. But then, you know, to make impact, you need to sort of get a user to use your product on a very regular basis or delight or change their life. So you have to be, have this great consumer impact, but the user is not the one who pays for the product. So you have to work through a complex ecosystem and figure out who's going to really pay you and work through a reimbursement model with a lot of regulation, right? One of the things I didn't mention, it's probably one of the most regulated fields at every level. So, and then finally, any little sector of it is very crowded. You can take a small portion like just hospital systems IT and that conference is bigger than the biggest sort of cloud computing conference. Um, and, 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 and so you have to then go work with enough ecosystem partners to sort of create a movement and get people to look and do things in a new direction, right? So, you have to be a great scientist entrepreneur, you have to be a great consumer entrepreneur, you have to be a great enterprise entrepreneur, and you have to be a movement creator. And you know, you can't really build a, an impactful, lasting healthcare company without doing all of these three, all of these four things. And I think that's why it's, it's a very challenging category for entrepreneurs. Uh, even if it's, <coughs> excuse me, even, even if it's so challenging, do you have any advice how, how entrepreneurs can succeed in, in the field? Obviously, it's, it's to uh, meet people like yourself who invest in the field, but any other advice? So I think uh, I can kind of talk about what are some of the more common mistakes I end up seeing uh, hap happen in this sure. space. So, so I'd say the two sort of most common mistakes <clears throat> I end up seeing is a lot of the tech entrepreneurs who enter sort of the healthcare domain will often start with how do I just kind of go do something quickly and, and make uh, some, some impact out with that. The, the, the general challenge is that that is good, but you really have to think about what kind of a business you're building and what, kind, what is going to be a long-term competitive advantage and whether it is solving a hard problem, having IP around it, or you know, data network effect, but, but not thinking through that part. It's quite different from like, you know, classic sort of you know, enterprise or consumer businesses where it's a land grab mentality and dynamic and you're just trying to be ahead of, of everybody else. So I think uh, that, that ends up being one. I think the second more common mistake that people will often make in healthcare companies uh, uh, is on the other side where they'll take a lot of the initial seed investment and, and spend it all on sort of trying to build the product or prove that you know, the science is right and not enough in proving the business model out. So you have the, the tech entrepreneurs who kind of come into it uh, without really thinking through a lot of the, on the barriers of entry. And so you see there's been a whole generation of digital health companies, a lot of hype went into those. Some of them had some very high profile IPOs and then went, went, went belly up. And then uh, coming on the deep science side, people often forget to think through the business and the business models mm. uh, around that. And then finally, the one factor that almost nobody sort of, you know, talks about it openly enough is uh, if a company has to be set up and built as a scalable company, the founders have to scale. And, and so by that, what I mean is that, uh, you know, you, this is a hard category and it's unlikely that a founder will know all of these things really well. So how are they setting themselves up to have a set of team of, you know, advisors? How are they going to grow? 
How are they going to go work through this? How are they going to go ahead and pull together a, you know, uh, a business model, a platform? And so effectively, I would encourage all the founders and seed investors to really think about uh, how are they going to scale? If a founder wants to be the CEO, <clears throat> I would argue that then they can't really be the science or the technical person, right? If you want to be a CEO, first-time founder, and there, this field does have a lot of first-time founders, then they have to commit themselves to becoming the best CEO uh, and then find somebody better than them, smarter than them, to be <laughs> sort of the technical product founder. It's hard to kind of go ahead and do both. And I think they owe it to their teams, uh, not only then, uh, uh, definitely the investors, but their teams to then sort of make it their mission to become the best uh, sort of leader and CEO that can be. Sure. Going back to the first problem, um, people like to succeed quickly. Is that, <clears throat> is that inherent just in Silicon Valley, or do you see that elsewhere? Is that just the, the mode of operating here as an entrepreneur? So, um, or is that elsewhere? You know, it's, uh, I think it's less a Silicon Valley thing, and it's more a tech thing, right? So okay. in, in my life, as I see entrepreneurs uh, you know, coming with deep uh, healthcare or life science backgrounds, and then I, we definitely see a lot of entrepreneurs coming with deep tech backgrounds. And, and I think if, you know, at the risk of sounding trite, right, if I was to make a generalization, That's I'd say right. the, tech, the, tech entrepreneur, the tech background entrepreneurs definitely show a very high degree of hustle and business maturity uh, and okay. have this tendency to let's just move fast and it's okay if we break stuff. <laughs> um, and, 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 and the driver is let me just get stuff done quickly and make me... Uh, a lot of the healthcare life science entrepreneurs are much more thoughtful. Uh, they are very, very mission oriented. They probably don't sort of uh, express uh, often the same sense of urgency. And so you kind of, you know, to do the company right, you're going to need the company to have both uh, to sort of do as an emerging company, right? If, if you're not going to have the sense of urgency and hustle and all of that stuff like that, then, then you know, it's not going to make the impact that a startup mm -hmm. aspires to kind of create. <clears throat> uh, but, uh, but, you know, and so it's very interesting because when you look at this whole gene editing space, right, uh, you know, the amount of time, even though, you know, there was the news of CRISPR babies, right, I mean, this field and all the lead scientists and entrepreneurs have been talking about the right ethical standards on it pretty much since the invention of CRISPR in 2012. Um, and, and versus you see in the news the Facebook and, and what, you know, ha you know what, what's the impact of Facebook through the elections and how long it has taken to even acknowledge that that's a problem. So that's kind of <laughs> symptomatic of, of the, the backgrounds of the people. Sure. As an investor, you probably want both a little, a little hustle and bustle and a little thoughtfulness from yeah. the entrepreneur. OK. Yeah. Um, good advice for entrepreneurs out there. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of AI enter into, into yeah. the healthcare field, whatever you want to call it, automated intelligence, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, how's that impacting uh, jobs in the field? Is that ultimately, are you of the stance that Robotics and, and AI advances are, are taking away jobs in the healthcare field or, or creating new opportunities? Yeah. Where do you come down on that? So I think AI is going to save healthcare. Mm -hmm. And by the way, how many of you want AI to replace your doctor? <laughs> None, right? A few. few. Three, few. We're in Silicon Valley and it's less than 10% of the audience, right? Right. So uh, I think uh, there's uh, quite a few VCs who are, you know, thumping on AI sort of replacing doctors and I, I'm, I'm not in one of those. Uh, buckets, I actually think it's a reverse. I think it's uh, AI is really more about in AI, intelligent augmentation. So uh, just a few sort of high-level factoids, right? Today, one out of nine jobs in America is actually related to healthcare. Uh, uh, in the next, uh, you know, in, in not that distant a future, today we have one retiree for every five working Americans. In uh, about 10 years, that number is going to be two retirees for every five working Americans. Uh, you're going to have more retirees than kids, right? So you sort of have this large population that is going to get taken, that has to be taken care of. Uh, and that just won't happen without, and so we're going to have a lot more AI jobs, but what is going to be expected of people, it's not going to go from like, you know, 10% of the jobs to 30% of the jobs in, in, in 10, 20 years. So we are going to need a lot more productivity. And so this is where I think AI is going to come in in a big way. It's going to allow for people to be in their homes longer, to get taken care of, to have assistance, to get driven around, all, all of those things. Uh, the second is the doctors themselves uh, want the intelligent augmentation. Today, they, you know, it has one of the highest kind of burnout ratios. Uh, 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 you know, the American Medical Association has recognized that mental health is actually an issue for doctors themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is because of the sheer sort of stress and overwork that they have, how much they have to do. So, so there's, you, can, you can sort of offload the doctors and make their lives that much, much better. 
And uh, you know, one of our first investments around this category was in a company that actually has become one of the leading AI and healthcare companies that's gone mainstream. It's a company called Qventus. You can What's it called? Qventus. Oh, I think they're based here in Mountain View. Right? Yes, they are. Yeah. They're not too far from here. Right. And, and what they figured was that how do you go ahead and use AI to sort of really tell people what they may need to do the moment they need to do that so that magic happens. Doctors love it because it allows them to give better care, patients' wait times go down, uh, you know, uh, fewer errors happen. Uh, and 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 uh, and the hospital profitability goes up. You, you know, it's uh, it's one of those few things where and and it does so by basically sort of being this AI brain that is just taking care to optimize the experience for every patient. And 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 for something like that, what they uh, were able to do is show that this is something that's deployed at scale, not just at El Camino and Stanford, but at New York Presbyterian and Emory and Mercy in Arkansas and Oklahoma and, and Fairview in Minnesota. And so. This whole point of how something like that, that becomes a system of action, that truly sort of operates um, you know, to optimize and improve the experience. Uh, so I think that's, that's more of the example of what we think happens with AI in sort of the healthcare system. The, the company Qventus, I, I believe you led the, the Series A. Is, yes. Is that gonna be the, the billion dollar healthcare company you, <laughs> you predict? Um, well, uh, I think uh, you know, uh, we definitely hope and yeah. expect it to be one of those, <laughs> uh, yeah. but, uh, but we think there's, uh, there's a lot of other companies that we've invested in, uh, and, and a lot of other investors I've invested in as well. I really think that we are going to find, uh, you know, all of tech is about five, six percent of the GDP, right? So when healthcare is like 20 percent of the GDP, and, and, and uh, uh, you know, I have a friend, who, uh, uh, Arvind Gupta, who, who likes to highlight the, the rate at which uh, a sector evolves. You can, uh, you, you can think of it as the mutation rate or the evolution rate, and, and this percent of R&D spend in that sector is reflecting that. So no points for guessing that tech companies have the highest percent of revenue on R&D spend, but right after tech, the next highest sector now, and that has changed dramatically in the last six, seven years, is actually uh, healthcare. Uh, as we wind down here, uh, what, what's your outlook? What sectors do you uh, find particularly um, uh, uh, opportunistic. That, what do you think is? What do you think we're primed for? What's What's your outlook? What What healthcare sectors should we uh, be focusing on? So uh, we we've taken a, a pretty broad look at, at sort of the system, uh, and so we have companies that sell direct to consumer uh, from a wellness perspective to com companies that sell to hospital systems on the provider side, mm -hmm. employers, uh, you know, uh, insurance companies, pharma companies. Uh, I think the common theme that I would basically sort of bring back to this thing is uh, the foundation of any of these companies and their cost structure and the business model gets set very early in the life. And at scale, it doesn't matter what kind of a healthcare company you're looking at, right? It will look like a really, really good tech company if you just look at the financials of it. And so, uh, you know, despite the, the science and the technology and all of that risk, in the end, it, it needs to be set up to be a very large-scale viable business. And so uh, there's a lot of healthcare services companies that VCs end up funding with venture valuations, which mm -hmm. have 40, 50, 60% gross margins. They are never going to create 25, 30 points of operating margin, which is what you need at scale to kind of create big venture, venture returns. So, so what we tend to look for is independent of sort of which subsector of healthcare it is, um, how is the core team thinking about sort of building a business out for the long haul? And the reason why that matters is because if they don't think through the business model right, then the product will get acquired into one of the existing larger companies, and they are not the ones who are going to go fix the system. So you people will have had many, many years of their life and the desire to sort of put impact get, that get clogged in the system uh, unless and until they can actually sort of become large standalone companies. I see. I've lost track of time. I don't know if we're over time or... We're just right on time? Okay. Uh, uh, does that mean you want me to wrap it up? <laughs> yeah? Okay. Uh, as as uh, Dan Rom comes in here with more coffee soon, I think. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I thought this was very educational. I, I look forward to, to seeing your investments and, and seeing, uh, seeing how you progress. Uh, join me in thanking uh, Urshi. Good job. Thank you. Thank you.